I actually start this uh, talk having uh, two major problems. Uh, one of which is that I'm going to talk about all of the ocean and all of climate change. And the other is that you cannot have lunch until I stop talking. <laughs> and so I take this responsibility very seriously. And I will try to cover this, this material as, uh, as quickly as possible. But it's a big ocean. And we are using it in, um, in a very set of serious ways. Uh, all across the ocean, anywhere you go, there are four major problems. There is local problems as well, but almost everywhere the same four things are problems. That is uh, pollution in the oceans, habitat destruction, overfishing, and then climate change. And today those four problems are affecting the way we use the ocean and the services that we get from the ocean uh, in, in incredible ways. Yet we have been using the ocean differently than we have used the land. Uh, it turns out that our use of the land has been industrialized for a lot longer than the industrialization of our use of the oceans. We are catching up in the oceans, though. This is a figure we published in, in Science a few uh, months ago. Uh, showing a timeline of how we have used the oceans from about 50,000 to 10,000 years ago uh, when use of the oceans was just beginning to even about 150 years ago. Now that's the time when the industrial revolution on land was in full swing. We had extensive agriculture and industrial use of land, but in the ocean we were still fishing with ships driven by sail and lines made of hemp and rope. Our use of the ocean was a lot less than on land. Right now, that's changing, but it's only been about 50 years that diesel-driven ships and uh, our ability to get anywhere in the ocean has increased to the point where any place in the world's ocean, deep, shallow, poles, the tropics, uh, is accessible to ocean fleets. That industrialization is increasing as we develop new kinds of industries, aquaculture, for example, that is being done in the ocean, seabed mining, uh, energy production from waves uh, and from solar, uh, building actual land above the water for people to live on. All of that is increasing right now and in the future is likely to change how we have used the ocean. So uh, in the future, the industrialization of the ocean is likely to be as great as it is on land. Uh, we're emptying the oceans because of our increased agriculture or industrial power to do so. 40,000 years ago, human communities were harvesting just coastal areas. Um, Mechanized fishing that is using machines only started 200 years ago. Right now what we have all over the world is what's called the scramble for fish. We have the ability to catch almost anything anywhere and so the uh, industrial fishing fleets of the world are racing for the fish that's there. And uh, ocean harvests cannot keep pace. Uh, there are about 100 million metric tons of food taken from the ocean and hundreds of millions of people actually rely on the sea for their primary source of animal protein. There is a big disconnect, however, because the 100 million metric tons is mostly mechanized commercial fishing, whereas the hundreds of millions of people relying on the ocean for their main animal protein are largely subsistence and artisanal fisheries in um, developing countries around the world. Uh, this is a recent plot of the food that we attain from the ocean up to about 2010. Uh, the lower part is actually the catch volumes of the world, that is the, the, the way we have been catching food. Uh, and then what's, what's shown here is without China's influence and then with China's catch. Um, well, you can see two important things about it. One is that uh, the catch from the oceans increased very steeply till about uh, 1985 or so, but it has been level since then, and in fact has been dropping since 19. 
85. So the, our use of the sea for food is actually getting harder and harder. Now right now, if you add aquaculture to this graph, then the line still keeps going up. That is, we have more food from the sea because of aquaculture uh, than we do just if you consider the wild catch. However, the reason why I did not include that on this line is because aquaculture, particularly for marine food, doesn't actually give us more fish because you have to feed fish other fish in order to make them grow, at least for the marine aquaculture. So marine aquaculture looks like it adds to the fish supply of the world, but it actually doesn't. It actually takes away from the fish supply. What about climate change and how that is affecting the way the oceans operate? And I want to spend most of my time on that. And we've heard a lot, particularly in Andreas' wonderful talk about the, the kinds of effects that uh, climate change has on the world. And the oceans share three of them. That is, uh, warmer temperatures, more storms, and higher sea level. And when we look at that combination, we can see that there are predicted to be market effects of all of those, higher sea level and more storms in particular, on areas of the world, all over the world, particularly coastal cities. Uh, this is the projected increase in flooding frequency uh, under predictions of sea level rise over the next century. And so uh, the, the more red or orange the dots are, the higher the increase in flooding frequency uh, there is expected to be. I randomly picked Europe to show you because it seemed like that would be a good idea. Um, if you take the next step and said, well, given this, what is the potential for inundation? That is the floods that uh, we have seen in coastal cities around the world. This is predicted for Europe based upon European Union data. And what you can see, particularly in Northern Europe, is that flooding frequency in coastal cities is projected to go up enormously because of the combined influence of sea level rise and, and storms. There is a fourth effect of uh, the ocean and, and climate change, and that's ocean acidification. What I've done here is put a very small piece of coral in vinegar. That's all. Now, vinegar is acidic, and acidic water can, makes the calcium carbonate in the skeleton of a coral bubble away. Now, the oceans are becoming more acidic. They will never get as acidic as vinegar. This is just a demonstration. Uh, but it shows that it's much more difficult for marine organisms to form their skeletons or their shells and keep them when the ocean is more acidified. CO2 going into the atmosphere dissolves in the oceans, as Andrea showed us. It goes into the ocean as carbonic acid, and as a result, the pH of the ocean has become more acidified over time. Well. All of these sorts of issues combine to make marine systems, ecosystems, uh, a lot more difficult to manage. Yet there's a strange mystery to the, our effect on the ocean versus the land. There have been about 500 extinctions recorded on land because of human activity over the last two centuries. There have been 15 extinctions in the ocean only 15. It seems like the ocean is doing fine, but in fact there's two other kinds of extinction that go on in the ocean we have to take account of. One is called commercial extinction, and that is when we use the ocean species to such a point where it's no longer profitable to exploit them. A good example is the is whales are all around the world, but where I'm from in Monterey, gray whales is a wonderful example. They started being hunted in 1854. By 1899, there were so few of them left that the commercial harvest of gray whales stopped. They were commercially extinct, although as a species, they, they, were still, they still existed. The other kind of extinction in the ocean is called ecological extinction, and that's where the species persists. It is not technically extinct, but it is so rare that it no longer plays its normal ecological role in the ecosystem. And a very good example, again, from my backyard is the sea otter, which, because of its wonderful fur, was extirpated from California in the early 1800s. Uh, sea otters eat a lot of food. They eat sea urchins. Sea urchins eat kelp. So without sea otters, 
the sea urchins became very abundant and destroyed the kelp forests in California in the 19th century. Yet, despite all of that trouble in the oceans, uh, and because real extinctions are so rare, the biological diversity of the oceans is still quite high. And what I want to do now is to give you a small little jolt. It's designed to wake you up, thanks to Stefano, who, who convinced me last night that I should include this in today's video. Uh, it, it will basically be 47 seconds. Uh, it will be sort of a marine biology degree in 47 seconds uh, with a rock and roll soundtrack. There you go. There you go. So now you're all marine biologists. <laughs> and that incredible diversity actually plays a strong role in making ecosystems function in very extreme environments. My, my son, who is a novelist, and I published a book about a year ago called The Extreme Life of the Sea, and it talks about how organisms live in the most extreme places, like deep sea hydrothermal vents here. I decided to give you one example of an animal you have never heard of because it's named after Pompeii, and this is the Pompeii worm. It lives in hydrothermal vents, in the deep sea, and the, the head of it, a little bit up here, lives at the temperature of hot tea. It's that warm. The tail of it lives, oop, I got it wrong. The tail of it lives at hot tea temperature. The head of it lives at ice water temperature. The worm is only this long. And so from one end to the other, it lives across an incredible extreme in temperatures. Now, we do not know how to make a biological process that can work at all those temperatures. Uh, but colleagues in France under the U European Union Research Center there have been decoding the genome of this worm in order to learn how to make biological proteins and do biotechnology at all temperatures in and all across a big range like that. So this kind of biodiversity is still out there in the ocean, and it is still incredibly valuable to us. Uh, yet climate change is actually shifting things in a very fast manner. Uh, these are some graphs you have seen before. Uh, it contrasts how fast the climate has changed in the past versus how it's changing now. If we look at the temperature change in the world over the last glaciation, uh, there's been about seven degrees change in 10,000 years, or 0.07 degrees per year. If we look at climate change over the last century, it's been about 0.8 degrees per year. That is, climate change over the last century has been 11 times faster than the most recent change uh, since glaciation. How do organisms cope with such incredible changes in their environment, and can they live in the future under those conditions? One of the things that I study is coral bleaching. Andreas told us a little bit about that. And it is one of the most visible signs of the effects of climate change in the world's oceans. Uh, this map shows the extent of coral bleaching in different parts of the world over the last 50 years. Red means there has been a, a lot of coral bleaching there. Green means there hasn't been uh, any. What you can see is across coral reefs, coral bleaching is a very common thing. What I'm going to do is show you a little bit about what we know about coral bleaching because understanding it at its mechanistic level has been a very important part of our trying to figure out how corals react to heat. And what I want to do is particularly show you what we mean by coral bleaching. This white skeleton is bleached. The coral is not dead. The coral is still alive. It's just colorless because it's lost its color. Its color came from an internal symbiont uh, in the coral itself. 
What I'm going to do in the, in the, in, uh, just to save time is to move, move forward through it and then tell you a little bit about what we, how we study coral bleaching instead of uh, worrying about that. What we have done is to go back to this particular kind of setting uh, and understand under what circumstances the corals lose their symbiont and actually turn white. Um, we do that in a small lab we've built in American Samoa uh, that mimics the heat of the ocean that occurs during um, episodes of coral bleaching. And here I'm just showing you graphically the uh, results of one such experiment. Uh, the coral here on the right is not bleached. It has its normal color. The coral here on the left has bleached. Now the only difference in these two corals is uh, where they were from. They're the same species. They were exposed to the same temperature uh, in our coral reefs uh, bleaching simulators. Uh, one bleached and one did not. Uh, it turns out that they were growing on, very, on different parts of the same reef. This coral was growing on a part of the reef that normally lived at cooler environments, and this coral was growing on a part of the reef that was normally living in warmer environments. It means that some corals are more resistant to coral bleaching than others, even though they're living on the same reefs and are the same species. So we've spent about five years trying to figure out the underlying mechanisms by which uh, these corals can actually resist heat. And we've done that by using uh, the genomics of these corals to try to understand the genes that are involved in how they actually respond to heat. Um, well, one of the easiest ways to go about doing that is, is actually to take the corals and move them around. So what we do is to take a coral, break it up into two pieces. Uh, we put one of those pieces in the warm part of the reef, what we call the warm pool. The other piece we put in the cooler part of the reef, exactly the same coral, the same genetics. We let them grow for about three years and then test them in the coral tank to see how resistant they are. And what's shown on the right there is a, is a relative graph of how the resistance of a single piece of coral that has been living for two years in the warm environment, which is the red, uh, bar and the cooler environment, which is the blue bar. And what you can see is the resistance to bleaching of that same coral is quite different depending upon where it has lived. What it tells us is that corals can acclimate. They can acquire heat resistance when they live in a warmer part of the reef. We've done this now with a number of species in lots of different colonies, and by and large, corals can get more heat resistant if they live in a warmer, in a warmer place. We have also looked at the underlying genetics of these corals. This is a graduate student of mine, uh, Rachel Bay. Uh, that's a little bit of the area that we work in in American Samoa. You can see why we work there. Um, and uh, by looking at the genomes of these corals across 28,000 genes, we can also see that corals that live normally in the warmer part of the reef are different at about 100 genes than the corals that live in the cooler part of the reef. That's not very many genetic differences, 100 genes out of 28,000, but it seems to be enough to give these corals a little bit of a boost to living in warmer water. So the, the result of all this, and I have just moved through five years of research in about three minutes, uh, is that these corals have two underlying mechanisms by which they can respond to changes in climate. One is acclimation, and that's the, ac the adjustment of an individual's physiology when, when it's exposed to different conditions. The other is adaptation, the normal Darwinian evolutionary process where individuals with the right genes to live in an environment um, do better in that environment. The individual changes very quickly. Uh, the population changes much more slowly. So when we think about the response of populations to climate change, we have to realize that evolution will happen slowly, acclimation can happen quickly. Now, why does this matter in terms of, of uh, ecosystem services and uh, climate change? It's mostly because coral reefs and a lot of coastal areas are in a dynamic balance 
between the erosion that happens because of storm surge and waves and their growth. And right now, the growth of corals is being inhibited by high temperatures and acidification. The need for growth is going up because sea level is rising. And the role of coral reefs in protecting coastlines is even more important as more and more people live near the coastlines, especially on tropical shores. So it's that growth of coral reefs that's being required to maintain these ecosystems and that uh, is, is falling behind. Well, uh, in one way, I'm giving you some sort of glimmers, tiny glimmers of hope about the response of marine populations to climate change. One is that marine populations are big, they span the oceans, extinctions are low. The other is that acclimation can make them more resilient to the future, adaptation can happen because of the large populations and lots of genetic diversity. But all of those, especially acclimation and adaptation, will only last for a very short time. It might provide some buffer to changes in the oceans over the next few decades, but all of the predictions, like the ones that Andreas was showing, suggest that the conditions in the oceans over the next century will become increasingly inhospitable unless there's a change in emission spectra. Nothing we have seen in our coral research suggests that corals can adapt and acclimate forever. In fact, it looks like they'll be out of the ability to acclimate and adapt in a few decades unless we change emissions. Yet we do have that extra buffer, that extra few decades um, to make this work. Um, Andrea showed us something like, like these graphs, um, and what they show are the different uh, CO2 emission scenarios with different uh, IPCC uh, designations. Um, he talked a lot about RCP 2.6 versus 8.5. 8.5 is the in continued increase in emissions over time. RCP 2.6 is one that drops off very dramatically over time. Uh, if you look at the total amount of CO2 in the atmosphere as a result of these different scenarios, uh, that's on the, the right there, um, the business as usual scenario has CO2 concentrations going up to 800 or 900 parts per million by the end of the century. Virtually all of the laboratory studies of marine organisms that have ever been done have shown that those levels of CO2 given current populations are generally deleterious to marine populations. Um, the scenario RCP 2.6 is about the only one that begins to get better by the end of the century. And that's what I want to sort of concentrate on because uh, there's a challenge here. That is, uh, if in fact we want the oceans to not become inhospitable to the kind of life that we need, then by the end of the century they, sh they must be getting better. If they're still getting worse by the end of the century, then the oceans are in serious trouble. But if they're getting better by the end of the century, then we, may, we will have essentially dodged this climate bullet. That means reducing climate and emissions levels uh, by 2050 to very seriously low levels, the, the kinds of changes that Andreas told us about earlier. Um, I want to propose this as a sort of a grand bargain among different kinds of people who are playing a role in climate. Uh, one of them are sets of engineers uh, that are trying to find solutions. Others are financiers. Others are political uh, people that understand how to motivate society. And then there's scientists, there's biologists, there's conservationists. And the grand bargain um, is this, that society will need to get a grip on admissions and reduce them seriously to the, to, uh, the level in 2050 so that uh, CO2 levels begin to drop. At the same time, there's a strong role for science and conservation, and that is to find areas where populations and species are more resistant and resilient to climate change, protect them, both in the ocean and on land, and our role is essentially to save as much as possible through the next century, so that when we get out of the emissions problem and the world begins to come a, to be a better place, there's enough of natural ecosystems to grow back from. Our experience in the ocean is that when we damage it, 
it declines. But if we protect the ocean, even after damaging it, the natural productivity of the ocean helps us restore it. So this is the grand bargain that I wanted to leave you with, that uh, moving towards a very much lower emission schedule in 35 years, dropping emissions 3% a year into that time frame, leaves us with the problem virtually solved. That's a huge difference than looking at the world and saying we have an unsolvable problem. It's not easy to drop emissions 3% a year, particularly with the population growing, but that's the goal. Associated with that as biologists are saving as much of the planet during this period of time so that uh, by the time CO2 begins to come back down, there's parts of the ocean, parts of land that can repopulate the areas that we need and love so much. Thank you very much.